evening and welcome to our Wednesday evening devotions. Before we start, I've just lit a candle for us there. Um, not because we need a candle, but just to show God's light in this dark world that we're currently living in. So let's open in prayer. Precious, loving, understanding Lord, tonight we come to you. We ask for forgiveness for the things we've done, but particularly tonight for the things that we are not aware of. Open our hearts, our eyes, our ears, our souls to hear you speaking to us so we can show your light to the world. We ask us in your very, very precious name, Lord. Amen. This evening, I want to share a path that God is leading me on. And I hasten to add, currently, I don't know where it's going to end, when it's going to end, but it's a path that he's leading me on. And I have the choice to follow him on this path or not. And I'm asking you to make the same choice with me. A few weeks ago, a church in our vicinity had a quotation on its steeple and for some reason that quotation challenged me. I'd seen it many times before, but for some reason that day it really made me think. And the quotation was, it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. Those words have been attributed to people like Eleanor Roosevelt, Confucius and many, many others. No one actually knows where they come from. And it's not biblical, but it is based on scripture. But you know what? God used those words. I've seen them before amidst the very busy, busy, busy early morning traffic to speak to me. Better to light a candle and to curse the darkness. Mark 4, verses 21 to 23, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version, says, And Jesus said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket, or under a bed, or on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone hears it, let him hear. So I would say yes, the candle does curse the darkness. But the crux of the saying is when it comes to light. Or as the good news says, it is brought out into the open. Light certainly dispels darkness. You only need to wake up. Wake up early one morning and look at our beautiful sunrises. Darkness almost seems to melt away as the sun creeps silently over the horizon. But as I continue on my journey with God, I turn another corner and I come to the last few weeks' sermons. They spoke to us about our own egos and how we use them, but more importantly, they spoke about the capital letter ego, E-G-O, or the edging God out egos. And it made me very deeply consider what and how do I do it? Do I edge God out? Unknowingly, probably. Or even more challengingly, has it become a lifestyle? And have I grown used to it? I have now realized that I do need to bring it out into the open, as the good news says. Thus, the candle journey continues. And the edging out, God out sermons has put me on this journey. And I have no idea where it's leading me. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 14 says, and no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. I am challenged. Am I aware of Satan being an angel of light in my life? I am not so sure 
And so my journey continues. How will I know or find out? Because I certainly want to follow the true light, not the fake light of Satan. And I must admit, I believe this is a message for each and every one of us. And as I pondered, some thoughts came to mind. And I believe we are basically three types of Christians. They are apathetic Christians, if I can call us that. They are complainers, and I hasten to remind you that this is merely my terminology. And then thirdly, the old world changes. My word, where do I fit into those categories? It feels like all of them to me at times. So let's look at them and see where I, as well as we at NMC, may fit in. Firstly, the apathetic Christians. Yes, as each one of us, we try to avoid the darkness in the world. We have no hope that the world can be changed. We retreat into what seems a shelter of apathy concerning the non-Christian world that we live in. Yet we're not truly apathetic. Our souls are aware of the wrong, the wrongdoing. But we believe that we cannot change the situation. Really, will we go out beyond the needs of our immediate family and friends, our comfort place? We love the Lord, but they don't know how or what to do to change the society or even to positively impact neighbourhoods. I remember growing up as a child in Bloemfontein, in the apartheid days, I must admit. And I must have been about six, seven, eight, I can't remember. But I remember questioning my mom. It was one evening, every night at about nine o'clock, the sirens would go off. And I asked my mom why the sirens went off every night and why the black people were not allowed to be on the streets. We were, why couldn't they? It didn't make sense to me. And I wanted to know. But my mom had no answer for me except to say, my girl, that's the law. And now looking back, it still haunts me. Although I realized as a child, there was nothing that I could have done about that. But my soul disagreed with it. And then what happened? I accepted it and I became used to it. So am I an apathetic Christian? I suspect so. The second group of Christians whom I call the complainers. These are Christians who are not by any chance part of the apathetic group. Far from it. They are the people who always rage at the depravity of the wicked world around us and keep telling us what is wrong and why it's wrong. It makes me think of people forever complaining about the politicians. Really? The state of this roads and country potholes. And of course I mean ESCOM. It's worth complaining about ESCOM. They pound the pulpit and the pavement. They don't lit up. And you'll probably always know what their viewpoint is and how bad everyone is. Does that sound familiar? I know that I personally often make a comment about load shedding. And yes, it does affect us. It does affect our situations. You know, in actual fact, there's pretty little that we can do about it. I mean, not many of us work for ESCOM. Not many of us are rich enough to buy ESCOM and to fix the situation. No, we just accept it and complain and complain and complain. All words, no actions. Should you know of anyone else like that, we often dismiss them. Here they go again. We cannot endure their harshness, and therefore nothing gets done. That has also challenged me. 
where do I fit in? Am I a complainer? Of course I am. ESCOM and all the discomforts, it's really worth complaining about. And my view of the two different groups, the apathetics as well as the complainers, they sincerely desire to see our country and our culture transformed. They're not happy with what's happening. They are troubled. The world is unchristian. Look at the thieves, particularly in the political sphere. No Christian would do that. Yet, we look at our unchristian world without being troubled that our own hearts are unchristlike. I find that a dreadful thought. I question myself. Is my heart unchristlike? Should I always be complaining? Surely not. And this leads me into the third group that I mentioned as the world changers. Am I a world changer? Definitely not. We leave that to the Bidens, the Roma posers, etc. I'd certainly say no, I'm not a world changer. But if we delve deeper into those words, world changes, we might just change our thoughts and realize that we, each and every one of us, can become a world changer, no matter what the situation we might find ourselves in. It's called transformation. It's the godly ego, the EGO situations, edging God out situations. But it's a reverse in a sense. We have reversed God out of our lives. And now we need to put him first at the forefront, to getting back into our lives. It's so profound and yet so simple. It's easy to become a world changer. It really is. Transform your mind. It doesn't sound easy, but it is. And I'm feeling challenged by the thought, but I do want to become a world changer. I believe that God says about me, myself, and I, and NMC, and he says it in Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 12. God says, This is Adam C, the tribe he loves and protects. He guards us all the day long, and he dwells in our midst. God will protect us. He will guide us. But there is one provision. He must dwell in our midst. Does God dwell in your midst? Are you willing to do as he prods? Only you can answer that. And I'm on the journey trying to answer that question myself. The world changes, I believe, are the smallest in number, yet the most powerful. He makes, it makes me think of Joshua and Caleb. Two spies out of 12 who came back and were brave enough to see what God wanted them to see. They saw the grapes. The other 10 saw the giants, not the grapes, and they were very, very frightened. Joshua and Caleb saw the grapes. If you go and read Judges chapter 7, a very, very interesting chapter, you will see how 300 men were chosen out of 22,000. That's an astronomical ratio, 22,000 to 300. And these 300, they were victorious. Because they had heard God speaking, and their leader Gideon trusted God to deliver. And guess what happened? Of course God delivered. It's also this very passion, in a sense, that separates a third group from the others. Though smallest in number, its members are the most effective. Throughout history, its members are world changers. 
These are the individuals who have understood one thing, and that's the priority of God. And each one of us can do that now. These are the folk who know that the Father's highest passion is to behold His Son revealed in each and every believer's soul. And even and Francis from Japan in his book, To Touch the Heart of God, he says that the primary quest is not to touch your neighbor, not to touch his heart, but foremost to touch the heart of God. They know that if they awaken God's pleasures, the power of his spirit will accompany their efforts. Change of mind, change of trance. Transformation. Transformation, if we awaken the Father's pleasures, the power of His Spirit will enter us and we will become world changers. It actually stuns me to realize how simple it is. If, as Bill said the other day, the unholy trinity, me, myself, and I, if I allow Christ to manifest through me, I will awaken the Almighty God. Here in my transformation is the power to touch cities, to redeem cultures, for it takes to transform people, to transform nations. My journey is on transformation, not of myself, but with God, to become not a world changer, but His world changer, as He works through and with me and where He wants me to work. There's a very profound saying, when you pray, what happens? God listens. When you listen, what happens? God talks. And when you believe what happens, God works. How often do you pray? Or worse, even not pray because the answer is impossible. It seems futile to keep praying for ESCOM, for our government, for we all know that nothing is going to change. So why waste our time? That is sadly the apathetic heart speaking. Why would God do something if we don't bother to pray? We choose to continue with the complainers group. After all, we cannot change anything. We can pray. It's not God's fault that our country is in the mess it is. So keep complaining. Do we honestly believe that God can work a miracle? And if the answer is yes, why can that miracle not be South Africa? So we need to be world changers, you and I, and believe that God will work for South Africa with us when we pray instead of complaining or doing nothing. Just pray and trust God. Nothing else except be a world changer. Don't edge God out by a small view of Him. He can and He does perform miracles. Trust Him and pray. And now let's close in prayer. Lord, we ask for forgiveness for not trusting you with our prayers. We become cynical. We become apathetic. And then we start complaining heavily instead of focusing on you. And yes, well, Lord, the world around us isn't good at the moment, but you are. Instilling us that desire just to touch your heart. And as we do that, the world fades into darkness and your light shines brightly in and through us. Lord, we can all, each and every one of us, be world changers if we would just go about our daily lives focusing on you, touching your heart, feeling your love. We ask us in your very precious, your powerful and your life-giving name, Amen. Thank you for joining us.